Energy is everything. It's what makes everything come to life, really. <laughs> it's keeping lights on for us, so in the evenings we can sit around a table, put on the heat pump and stay warm. It helps us get from A to B. Sun, a form of energy, helps grow food that then nourishes our bodies. Energy is at the heart and centre of everything. But it's not free. We're seeing increased energy poverty across the country. People unable to pay their power bills. Energy is not clean. We're seeing coal and gas generation for our electricity, even though we have abundant resources of renewable, clean energy. Energy is not secure. We're seeing increased communities suffering from being cut off their power supply. My name is Alva. I work for 350 Aotearoa. Um, for a number of years, got involved as a grassroots climate activist and organising actions and feeling really passionate about what we were campaigning on um, rather than my studies. So not surprising that I ended up in a staff role <laughs> and making this my job and feel really lucky to do that. When I started researching and looking into, into the electricity sector in New Zealand, very quickly it led me to realising that there are so many layers to it. We could just keep this like same system running. We've got four big power companies and maybe I just need to give them a phone call. I just need to have a chat to them and, and they'll finally build that, that more renewable generation. Maybe they just forgot about it. <laughs> they just need a bit of pressure. But no, it's not as simple as that. The system has been built to benefit shareholders, to benefit big power companies, to, to commodify electricity really, which it's not. Um, it's our basic human need. And in order to address that, we need a fundamental shift. We need to create an alternative to what we currently have. So that led me to community energy projects. And the more I got into it and on this journey of visiting the community energy projects, I learned that not only is there new renewable generation, but there's these communities are thinking about energy and electricity in a completely different way than I had previously been thinking about it. So we went to Otaki, where Energize Otaki is one of the, the the first um, and most long-standing community energy projects here, um, and to Raglan, um, which is quite a new and upcoming community energy project. Looks like you've done this before. No, I haven't actually. Oh yeah? This is my first time. But isn't it a great thing to be doing? Totally. It's such a lovely day in we are looking after the environment and saving on gym fees. <laughs> <laughs> so when Energize Wataki started this project, we wanted to do some feature something big. And we were lucky we got it funded. We had a key funding stakeholder that just thought the model was brilliant. Generating revenue from the sun in a town that goes back into the community. So that was the general principle. All the money that's generated by these panels other than what is needed for maintenance and insurance and so on goes into a fund, the Whakahiko Fund, which is a separate trust and from there it's distributed to people within the community, people in groups within the community that want to do energy related projects. People don't have to rely on big companies to do the right thing. Every community can get together, raise the money, but I mean this is an example of what a community can do. You think that's clean enough? That looks great. <laughs> <laughs> so Energize Orkutaki is, is a trust or an organisation which is, um, wants to transform how the town uses energy and how it makes energy and how it distributes the benefits from that um, into the community. Always take the view that it's important if you're talking about the future and change that you 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 approach it through a whole lot of different doorways, I suppose. And the kids and the growing things, that's all about them knowing that, but it's also about reducing energy use. Um, it's about 
knowledge, being able to build a sustainable future. You um like bees so much. They're just so chill. They're not like wasps. They act when how you act normally. So if you're scared of them, they'll they'll be angry and scared of you. But if you're calm, they'll be calm. Because they act off how you act. I just find it amazing, like to hang out with kids basically on a one-on-one -on -one level or a small group. We just get the chance to get to know each other and they get to know the garden. What I hope at least is that having a garden that you don't need to be interested in the garden to come here and enjoy it um, you know a lot of students can come through here and it's not about you know the grapes or the grapefruit but just through being here through hanging out they're engaging with or hearing about or seeing smelling touching um, food real food what we spent the the money on. I'll take you to our compost bins. We have the most glamorous carbon cycle. These are, this is a carbon cycle compost bin. So we spent, and people kind of go, oh my god, they're so expensive, that's ridiculous. And I go, yeah, but have you used one? <laughs> the more compost we have, the more boxes we can fill, the more food there is out in the community, the more people get the benefit of what we're doing, which is growing fresh, local, you know, nutritional, great food and good soil from waste. How cool is that? When we look at our Warm Up Otaki project, that's very much driven by the, the need to address energy poverty, release people's, some people's income that they can choose what they can spend it on whether it's on their kids, whether it's on God help us that they have to spend it on food rather than, you know, whatever that choice is, it gives them more choice, hopefully, and more sense of control over their lives just in their, in their own home. Warmth is everything, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I stay too cold, you know, the whole body aches, whereas ordinarily it's only, it's cramping when, it, when I'm picking heavy things up. But if it's cold, it's um, my health suffers. Mm -hmm. So it really has helped. Mm -hmm. And I think it must help with the um, power, you know, not having to keep the heater on all the time. And I think what we're trying to do that's maybe a little bit different is that it's often quite hard for people to navigate to get the subsidy and support to, to do these small home improvements. And so we're trying to be that personable support so we can be that contact, be that communication and, and support people through the process or help people through to get the curtains or get the insulation that they normally, you know, some people would struggle struggle to do. So that's kind of where we're, where we're sitting positioning ourselves. Well, the bikes are an obvious one. There's a couple of things in there. You've got families that can't afford for their kids to have bikes, particularly as they get grow older and get larger and buying a new bikes is quite hard. So there's a kind of just a a fairness thing in there about people being able to access something like that. But then if we get more kids on bikes or more adults on bikes, um, then um, that'll reduce the local trips. But equally, if the town becomes known as a place where, you, where biking's big, um, that will attract people to come in. And there's an economic aspect to it as well as this town is, becomes more and more known as a unique place where some really interesting things are happening um, and um, people can come and see them and be part of it. You might even know how to ride. I can't ride a bike. Yes. No. Yes. We we'll strap you to it and stick you on the top, hope, of, the, top of the river tuckers. <laughs> yes, hope for the best. You might have to put the seat down a little. At our last giveaway, we had a family of six come in. Um, some of the kids I work at college and some of the kids we saw riding the bikes to college. They had no way of getting to college otherwise. They came along the bike, um, along the straight, out from the beach. And then we saw the parents multiple times after just cycling around with the kids, which is, you know, really good. It's good for them. It's good for the environment. Um, the other thing that we found is there's quite a few grandparents that don't necessarily want to purchase a brand new bike for little ones, um, but they can get, they'll give us a call half for a bike 
bring it back a year later for a koha for another bike um, because it's a good feel good project and the money goes back into other projects for Energise as well. It's about the town physically, socially, economically having control over its future um, in a way that if you are just going to rely on the energy companies or whatever, um, you don't have the same control or you'll never have the same control over your future. Um, and waiting for the government who does, can do really good things, but waiting for them for that to trickle down into this community can, can be waiting for quite a while as well. So it's just taking control of your future. Raglan is a town of people that uh, most of us are here because we love it and we want to be here. And we're, we're a town of people that stand up and say uh, what we want and stand up for what we believe in. And um, yeah, years on now we're doing this uh, community energy project there's a number of arms to the whole community energy project, which is just starting in its journey. Um, and the initial thrust of it is to put some solar panels on top of roofs existing within Raglan, um, and then build up the, the what we call the peer-to-peer -peer trading, so that we can trade that out excess generation off that off that facility to members of the community that need it. If you can actually start producing it at the actual usage point versus at the, somewhere down the road at some hydro dam or coal burning sort of power station, then why not cut through all that and get people actually making their own electricity? It's, it's the community that will actually be the best conservation of energy in their usage profiles if we all work together. If, you're, if you've got the ability to generate it through a solar system or whatever, um, and you don't need it at that moment in time because it's all moments in time, um, it can go to someone who is using that and then vice versa you can draw it back as and when you're using it. So it's very, it's a very agile entity or, or that we can um, share. Yeah, utilising um, different buildings in the community to overgenerate solar so that we can um, gift energy to people with energy hardship, like that's a, a fantastic project um, and I'm proud to be part of it. In the early um, documentary about Extreme Zero Waste and two of the young employees who were probably in their late teens, early 20s, and they were asked um, by the interviewer to say, what did you have here before a resource recovery centre? And there was this look of puzzlement on their face and they said, I think they used to have a hole in the ground that they put all of the stuff in. And then they looked at each other as if to say, that can't be true. That's the most ridiculous answer. I guess um, being a father was a, a main push for me that gave me the energy. What sort of a, a community, what sort of an environment do I want to raise my children in? And also the fact that everything is through a Māori world um, lens, but also a community um, lens. Everything is connected, it's all holistically connected together. And so the community, yes, was suffering the negative impacts of the landfill, but it was also suffering because we were a small community. We were exporting all of our kids over the hill to employment opportunities elsewhere, and very difficult to get them back into Raglan. And many of the businesses weren't operating during the winter months but just because there wasn't enough coin um, to go around. And so Extreme Zero Waste um, built a plan around zero waste but also about um, training opportunities and localising employment. And for us in the community sector, we are often the ones that are the restorers. We're the ones that um, work on some social, cultural, local, um, local economy and environment but only because we allow um, corporates and industry to behave badly and create negative impacts. We're, we're, we're sick of being the restorers. We want all industry to be, at a minimum, have no negative impact on social, cultural, local, economic and environment. And probably for a period of time, they actually need to be restorative and actually offer some positive benefits to those things. But we, we don't want, we see 
um, in 20 years time that there is no difference between community enterprise and private enterprise. Everyone has, is a level playing field and we're all behaving the same way. No negative impacts. Um, we asked the boys what, type, what colour they wanted all of their equipment. They designed everything here. Yeah. They designed all of the colours, the heights and everything. They were all involved. And yeah, pink baler. Damn, that's good. It is all about the community. And it's about also what we can give back to the community. And there's a huge social side to that as well. Um, so if we look at the, the link between community energy and, and extreme, it's how can we take the team at extreme and upskill them in energy and potentially um, they start to learn how to put solar panels on roofs and do solar installations, etc. So it's cross training and, and cross subsidization between the organizations for the betterment of the community. Through giving communities a level playing field so they have a chance to compete with these big energy companies, whether this is through financial resources or removing policy barriers, which is preventing many projects from going ahead, that we can have community energy projects in every town and city across the country. A small handful of companies um, have got a monopoly in the electricity market. They own most of the generation, they do most of the retailing, they pretty much dictate how much renewable electricity there is and how much our power is. If communities, however, like the communities we've been visiting, have the resources and the agency to produce and store and retail their own electricity, we see that these good benefits of clean renewable energy and affordable energy stay within the community. And our government can be really instrumental in making this shift happen and to put community-led solutions at the heart and centre of New Zealand's energy strategy going forward. In order to finally put an end to the system that is using us to make profits of one of our most basic human needs, we need an uprising. We need people to say, no more of this. We can produce our own power. We need you. We need you to go out into your community, to talk to your community and to decide that we want to put an end to this. I hope that you watching these amazing community energy projects who, despite the odds, have already made it, is what you want for your community. And to make it happen, get together, call on your decision makers, and speak up for the future that you want to see. A clean, renewable energy future, produced by homegrown power.